Welcome back to the channel. You've all heard of Leave EU, and most of you would have heard of the Cadwalder case, but do you really know what that case entailed? Well, to explain it in more detail and probably better than I could, we welcome back our Alan Robertshaw Esquire. How are you doing today, Al? Very well, thank you. Thank you for that optimism. <laughs> yeah, <this> is, um, <laughs> well, I thought I'd better give it to somebody because most people don't understand this case. And in fact, lots of people talking about it are getting it wrong. And so we thought it would be a good idea to talk a little bit about it because the BBC is talking about it. Lots of people are talking about it because there's significant costs at play. And the real question is, has Leave EU killed free speech? So why would that even be a question? And what on earth is this case all about, Al? Well, yeah, like we said, there's um, a lot of confusion and misinformation out there about this case, especially now it's we've had the appeal. So just to add to that, um, just to give a summary, we've discussed um, quite at length um, on the regular channel about this case in the past. What happened was um, this case between somebody called Aaron Banks and Carol Cadwalder. Uh, Carol's a journalist. And she reported uh, about Mr. Banks um, his involvement with the Leave.eu campaign. There were suggestions of impropriety with like Russian funding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So she puts an article about that, saying, "Look, this is a guy who you know clearly needs investigation. There's something not right here." Um, he sues. Now, what's interesting is, at first instance, um, Carol won. And they said, well, actually, yes, um, you, you know, you succeeded in your public interest defence. But there was one issue, which was this. At the time she put the original article, and there were TED Talks and tweets and all sorts of things. Um, but in, so it, basically, she said, well, this is a guy, he's being investigated, you know, it, it's all highly suspect. That's all fine. God said that's fine. However, during the currency of all her articles, uh, the investigation came back and they said, actually, this guy is clean. I mean, there are lots of, you know, other aspects that she was criticising, but said well, on this particular sort of, you know, Russian money type allegation, mm. this guy is clean. Now, unfortunately, Miss Cadwalder did not update anybody after that. So the issue was, even if you had a defence initially, uh, in, you know, in this case it was public interest, if new information comes to light, do you lose that protection from that day on unless you you know, clarify the position. And that was yes. uh, the main ground of appeal. I mean, banks put in a few grounds of appeal, and this will become relevant when we talk about costs. But um, he succeeded on that. They said, OK, we reject all your other grounds. However, we accept this particular ground. Therefore, we are going to reverse the original decision. Now, the consequences of that were quite devastating because, you know, defamation proceedings are hideously expensive, as we all know. Mm -hmm. Um, and banks had been ordered to pay, I think, about £745,000 or something of Cadwalder's legal costs. She now has to give that back. Also, she has to pay his legal costs and costs contributing towards the appeal. Now, a few people said, well, hang on, what's going on here? Because, you know, the court actually ruled in her favour on nearly every issue. Um, but I find it's perhaps easier to look at it, consider a criminal appeal. OK, um, I, I'm banged up, and I submit three grounds to the Court of Appeal why I shouldn't be banged up. They reject two of them. They go, no, they're rubbish. However, you're right about this one, OK? So even though technically I've lost 66 to 33, I still go free. So it's a win, and anybody would see that as a win. And because you've proven part of the case. Yeah. I mean, basically, he has achieved what he set out to achieve, which is he succeeded in a defamation claim. And he's, he's got damages for that, albeit, you know, only £35,000. Then it comes to the costs issue. And as we've all said here, the general rule in English litigation, unlike in America, is loser pays winner's costs. And the starting position is, it's like, well, well who got home on the key issue? Mm. Um, and the court actually said, they said, we can see that there's an argument for just applying the complete usual rule, which is you pay all the costs. However, they perhaps exercised a little bit of mercy and they said, well, we did spend quite a little time on some issues that Mr. Banks did not succeed on. So tell you what, you don't have to pay for that aspect of the costs. Now, even though Banks technically lost on that, he doesn't have to pay any of her costs because he's fundamentally 
the winner. But what they've done is they've discounted and said you only have to, you know, basically we'll split it 60-40. You won't have to pay all of them. So that, so that's the position we're in. So the question is, was this a slap? Well, the court looked at this and said, actually, no, we have decided it's not. Now, of course, we're all open to disagreeing with judicial interpretations. Yeah, strategic but, litigation, know. just for those that are unaware yeah. of. Oh, yes. Strategic litigation against public participation. People throwing their financial resources around to shut people up out of embarrassment. Which is a big deal because companies do very often throw a lot of resources at a case just to stop people pursuing it. And that's not just against uh, publications and freedom of speech. That's across the board. Yep. Very often we will get cases with big firms going against Let's you know, let's call it the the little guy, as it's referred to, with um, the individual with a claim with a problem, and they get these big firms coming after them, saying we're going to seek costs and we're going to fight you and throw all our resources at it and everything like that. It's a similar thing, and I don't I don't think that's fair. Uh, and just to pick up on another point from g g going back a step before you go forward again, Al, is picking up on uh, getting home on one point. It's it's often the case with negligence or breach of contract, there may be a number of different arguments for breach of contract. You know, you did this, you did this, you did this, and these are the five separate reasons we say you breach contract. Or particularly with negligence, there might be a whole string of 15 different reasons. You were negligent for all these reasons. You only need to prove one of them to show there was a breach of contract or negligence and then you've you essentially won the claim. So it's not all of them you need to prove is essentially one of them. Because if there was a breach, if there was negligence, then you, you essentially win the claim. But as Al said, the court will then usually go on to say, well, how much time did we spend talking about these issues that you lost on? Uh, and that's where we got to. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's the old, you know, to, to, to misquote somebody um, or to use a quote in the wrong sense, you know, we have to be lucky every time, you only have to be lucky once. Um, you know, that, that's the situation you're quite often in when it yeah. comes to kit, especially appeals, because you've always got this dilemma of do you throw the kitchen sink or do you pick your best point? In terms of amateur trade, I'm, I'm a big fan of the just use your one best point thing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm a notorious minimalist, which is another way of saying I'm too lazy to draft all the pleadings. Um, but yeah, in this particular case, so is this a stifling effect? Well, there's two things to look at. Fundamentally, there's the actual merits of the case. Now, I would say, and this is just, you know, my not advice, um, just opinion, this could all have been avoided had she have done a one-line update on the results of the investigation. Because then the it would have been fair and accurate reporting. It's like this guy has been, mm. you know, under investigation. The investigation has cleared him. But here's still a load of other stuff that, you know, I am concerned about. And I think it's in the public interest to discuss mm. that. And so this Raising could probably yes. be avoided. And, and this is the thing. And this is why pre-publication, or in this case it would be post-publication, but constantly updated advice, is so mm -hmm. essential. Because if you're going to put yourself out there and say, I am somebody you can trust and I am authoritative, mm -hmm. then you, you know, that makes the defamation worse. Because, you know, it's yeah. almost against the defamation to say this person is so, you know, unreliable and nobody takes them seriously. That, yeah. you know, it's not defamatory because no person in their right mind would believe it. I mean, that was the defense that Fox has successfully run in all the claims against Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. They've literally gone there and said, no reasonable person would believe a word any of our, our presenters say. That's why you often see uh, news articles will say updated on whatever date. And in the case of YouTube videos, let's say the, there's there's something that you want to update. You can't, well, the, you, you, you can change to edit out part of a, a YouTube video, but that doesn't say you've updated it as such. You've eliminated a bit of it. But what you can do is pin a comment or edit the description or whatever. And that's akin to editing and updating and saying, well, you know, on reflection, here's, here's a bit more information, which some of the news companies do as well. But on their own websites, they will usually, even years after the event, they will update it to say, here's the update. Um, yeah. That's why there's one or two I've done in the last few weeks that I've, that have hit the news again because they've been updated and so I've updated, I've done a video to say this is what they are now saying, even though it's been updated from several years 
prior? Well, to, to mention that case that will not die, this is why the Washington Post left mm. the offending op-ed up, but just added one line at the top, result yeah. saying, by the way, there's been a court case on this, and this was found yeah, to be. Yeah. You know, this uh, by, by the way, there's been, yeah, this has been updated. There's been another court case, and yeah, we'll just, we just update that and just put a one yeah. line into it. Yeah. But that, that would probably be all the protection she's needed. So now here's the yeah. thing. Is this an attack on free speech? Well, obviously, she's now facing, she's had to pay back the original court costs, so she will have to. And she's also got to pay a massive amount of Banks' costs. Now, the way it works where you get, uh, you know, complex trials, usually costs, you'll try and do them on the day, what we call summary assessment. Look, I say, I've won, I think I should get this. And you do a very rough and ready calculation, and they go, you're getting this much, go away. Now, I prefer that, because at least then... You know, you've you've got you've got so you've got you've got some money coming your way within a yeah. fixed time. But if it's a complicated one, they will say cost to be assessed if not agreed. Mm -hmm. um, but there'll be an interim payment, and usually that's about fifty, sixty percent of sometimes as high as seventy or eighty. But d depending mm -hmm. on you know how you know t tight the cost budget is. Uh, in defamation, by the way, and in complex litigation now, but we started it, you put in a cost budget in advance of anything. Start at a very early stage, you say, you go in front of a special type of judge called a high court master and say, hey, this is what we think we'll spend on this. And you do a big breakdown of, you know, it's all spreadsheets saying if this happens, then this, then if yeah. this happens, this will take statements. And they're pre-approved. So quite often, if you come within your cost budget, it makes it a lot easier to argue you should get all your costs or the majority mm. of them. But they go off to be assessed in front of a special cost judge. However, there's usually an interim payment, and that's what's happened in this case. They said, okay, these costs to be agreed, if not assessed, but in the interim, you've got to pay £400,000 towards them. And that's got to be paid you know, usually very quickly within sort of 14 to 28 14, days. Yeah, right? 14, standard 14 to 28 days. So you can ask for more time, and you, you, you usually get it. But then people have to make a choice as to whether they go to all the expense of initiating the cost assessment or do they just go let's just see what we can get first and then we'll worry yeah. about it again there are very strict time limits on this and this is something we need to chat about because it's it's something that actually affects you know regular people if you're just you know this yeah. happen if you do contract claim with a builder and again it, it depends on the attitude of the parties which hugely frustrates me which was one of the reasons for creating this channel in the first place is because some firms and and claimants with their instructions i'm not you know, to varying degrees, it's the clients or the firms involved, but they have instructions or act on instructions or provide advice uh, to make it difficult to get those costs at all. And by that, I mean, they just don't agree with uh, the, the, the costs in the first place. So it has to go to assessment. So it drags it on even further. And then clients are then forced to pay yet further advice further drafting further hearings so you're paying costs to argue about costs yeah and even fixed costs sometimes and then we get questions like these are fixed costs these are costs that the short the, the court will order regardless why do i need to pay someone to tell me what fixed costs are when they're in a tabular format in the rules and that's what it is well yeah because there's the cost of the assessment for the and the rule, the, re, the rule is that the paying party generally pays the costs of the assessment proceedings, unless, of course, they reduce the cost by so much, usually about 20%, and say, well, actually, the other side should have come to some yeah, agreement they, they on should, yeah. and then The receiving party pays. But what you quite often get is, in the same way that you get these Part 36 offers, you know, in litigation, I will accept this, or I'll pay you this. You do that in the cost proceedings as well. And then it's a matter of, did you beat that? It's like, okay, I'll accept 95% of my costs. I'll accept 80% of my costs. And then it's a gamble as to, well, do you pay that? Do you think you'll beat that, you know, in front of a cost judge? I mean, these detailed assessment, which is what it's called, is really detailed. It's literally one line by line. Line by every, line, yeah. Every single unit of expense. Every letter, every, every six minutes. Oh, um, yeah. Whatever time's been spent and paid for. Will, yeah. will get considered even not um, not just to the time that's spent but what it was spent on by you know by whom uh the time was accounted for and even what rates they were in what area of the country everything so yeah it's, those, it's those can get quite quite deep i i had one case once uh, we're in a particular area of the country with a particular type of 
a band of solicitor from somewhere else. And then the judge, even then the judge said, well, I don't know is the answer, whether I can award that amount of cost for that band of solicitor from that area for this area. And we all sat and agreed that we didn't know. Uh, so we just agreed to come up with a figure that none of us were really sure on. And it was just the best we could do at the, at the time, but that's the way it is. So these are never straightforward. So anyone that says it's a, a yes, no answer is, is not, not quite the case. But there we go. Well, um, oh, so I was say free speech, perhaps. I was just about to say, there's a great book on costs called Cook on Costs by a judge, Judge Cook. He started that because he, he, he just wrote that because he said, let's face it, most costs hearings are two people who know nothing about costs hanging in front of somebody who knows even less. So that's why I've written this book. <laughs> it's fantastic. I always think it's, particularly when it comes down to the fixed costs, I always think it's uh, it's hugely ironic that you're paying costs to someone to argue about costs that were fixed in the first place to avoid ambiguity on costs. <laughs> it's a bit like that... Um, the simplified guide for litigants in person is like 68 pages long or, or, or whatever. So you get to read a book for the simplified version of what the CPR is. And even then you get to court and uh, you still need to know the rules because now these days there are very few exceptions made for litigants in person for not knowing the rules, which with respect, right. you won't know. <laughs> Well, there's a case called, uh, we'll have to do a big thing about, uh, it's a great case because it's called, it's called Barton and Wright Hassel, and Wright Hassel yes. were the names of the solicitors, it's W-R-I-H-D, but I thought Wright Hassel is a great name for a solicitor's firm. Yes. Well, there we are. Uh, so we thought you'd find that interesting. Any uh, closing words, Al? No, I think, like I say, what, what we'll have to do is, because uh, Carol Cadwalder is on what we call a CFA and AT insurance. That's where yes. basically CFA is the old no window fees. And AT is after the event insurance because I am being sued. I, there is a risk I will have to pay the other side's legal mm -hmm. costs. But I think I'm going to win. So can I find an insurer who also thinks that and, will, and in exchange for a premium will actually insure me against me having to pay costs? And that apparently mm -hmm. is what's happened in this case. But uh, CFAs, AT insurance, um, damages based agreements you know like i'll take a chunk of your winnings this is something that i think is a good topic for another video but we can do it like you know it applies to everything not just this very very specialist area but yeah hope people see that so you know is it an attack on free speech well that's a you know a, an exercise for the reader but i just wanted to clarify because there seems to be a lot of confusion over there as to you know who won and what you know people go oh she won it's like she won on 98 percent of it why is she paying cost Exactly. Why. It's it's a bit like when someone reports that, oh, they've apologized for something. Like, well, that doesn't mean they want like they've given given the towel in or the other side's won the case. They, they might have apologized for something. It doesn't mean it's the end of the line. So no. always, always more to it. So always approach even news with an open mind, because even they um, I won't say get it wrong to be disparaging, but report it in a way that people may misunderstand is probably a better way of putting it. Diplomatically put. Indeed. And with that, uh, we thank you for watching. Uh, do check out our very, very slightly revamped channel name, which is Art, Media and Law, as opposed to Art and Media Law. So we're not refi we're not sort of putting ourselves in such a small box anymore, are we? Are we are um, we're branching out. Well, I know because because I I have a very wide view of what art is, and I think everything is art. So basically, by because it it was always art, comma and media law. It was not art law and media law. It was art and media Indeed. law. And I, we live in a world of art, so that's my excuse for just rambling about anything. Well, there we go. Make sure you subscribe to that as well. It's in the description. Uh, it's growing nicely. Thank you all for that. Uh, thank you for that support on that slightly more niche yet very interesting and very intricate areas of law that we look forward to talking to you about very much more. And with that, uh, make sure you subscribe and we'll see you next time.